Footloose is a good way to describe how we make these films. My cameraman husband and I have found the best way to discover and enjoy a country's most beautiful places is to walk the trails, pathways and streets. places in Italy, Venice in the northeast, which needs no introduction, and the Cinque Terre National Park in Liguria on the northwest coastline. Few people in the UK have heard about the spectacular Cinque Terre landscape, yet visitors from many other countries come to this region to enjoy the unique scenery and sample its food and wine. The Cinque Terre means five lands and there are five charming little villages to discover and experience. This is a very special area. It's different from everything. We have six thousands of kilometers of dry stone walls held by nothing. I mean, a dry stone wall is just a wall made by stone, so there is nothing. And we have these dry stone walls from 1,000 years, and we have vineyards. And so when you come in the Cinque Terre, the landscape is unreal. It's something different. We try to preserve all this. It's very difficult because now, with the border times, things have changed. But at least I think that the five villages are still intact. How can one get to the different villages? Well, the best way is by boat. We are on board on a boat. This is one of the boats that usually connect the La Spezia to the Cinque Terre. Then you can use the train. Well, the train is less panoramic because pass through tunnels, but it's quicker. Maybe it's a little bit cheaper, but it's quicker. By bus, you can reach the second village of the Cinque Terre, Manarola, but it's best to leave the bus here and enjoy your boat or your train. The Cinque Terre is not very well known in England. Why do you think that is? Well, uh, it's not so true. I work, well, we have a, a tourist information office in La Spezia, of course, and we have very often, I have to bring journalists, I've along in the Cinque Terre, mostly are Americans. So if any journalists of British journalists want to come here and enjoy, they're welcome. We are going to show them everything for free. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to be a good publicity for us. I don't know. What amenities are here for the traveller? We have a little bit of everything. <laughs> I mean, tourists that come in the Cinque Terre, they can do trekking, they can swim, they just sip a glass of wine and enjoy the sunset so they can do everything. <laughs> we took Fulvia's advice and started our walking journey through the five lands by taking a boat from our hotel at La Spezia to Porto Venera to catch the Cinque Terre ferry. Porto Venera is recognised by UNESCO as a World Cultural Heritage Site. The original 12th century Genoese castle and church were rebuilt in the 1930s and housed some remarkable works of art. The distinct tower-shaped houses fronting the harbour form part of the castle wall with steep narrow passages between them. The church of San Pietro was built in 1277 on existing 6th century foundations. It was only a short trip around the headland before we had a glimpse of the first village and the start of our coastal walk. The first thing that struck me was how steeply the houses tumbled down the hillside. 
This is picturesque Rio Maggiore, the first of the Cinque Terre villages. I'm really looking forward to the coastal walk. There's going to be some fantastic photography here. Rio Maggiore's centre reportedly dates back to the 7th century, when tower-shaped houses were built parallel to a narrow river. Steps. I have the feeling this is the first of many flights of steps. This is the end of the tunnel to the rest of the village. There's a lot of people here. There's a lot of people here, Dad. I know. Monday is what day? Years ago, a river ran between the buildings down the main street. In the 19th century, the villagers inventively paved over this watercourse, which still drains to the sea. The church of San Giorgio Battista is 14th century and contains a beautiful marble tracery rose window, a feature to look out for in all of the churches in the five villages. The castle is 13th century and the chapel of San Rocco and San Sebastiano was built in 1480 to commemorate deliverance from a plague. Prior to the advent of the railway, all five villages were isolated from each other, contact only possible by the footpaths and the sea. Road access, even today, is slow and tortuous. Rio Maggiore is connected by a mainline railway travelling through tunnels to all the Cinque Terre villages. It connects with Genoa, La Spezia and Pisa and all the northern cities. The Cinque Terre became a national park in 1999 in order to protect its unique landscape. There are information offices at each of the railway stations to help visitors explore the region's delightful villages and footpaths, which reach high up in the terraced mountains. To help finance the park, admission is charged to walk on the paths, and you can buy a Cinque Terre card, which enables you to travel on the trains, use the trails, and ride on the green, eco-friendly park buses. The National Park is very proud of its thousand-year-old heritage. We spoke to the President. For a thousand of years, Cinque Terre has been like a cultural laboratory. The first settlements date back to around 1000 AD. However, the relationships between man and environment which has preserved the landscape and served as a testimony to what a collectivist society can achieve, has gradually been eroded. It came under threat of being broken at the end of the 1990s, with the rise of tourism and the abandonment of agriculture. That's when the local authorities saw the granting of national park status as the only way of interrupting this negative pattern. By working together, we were able to promote a relationship between man and environment along different principles. Signor Bonanini, what can the visitors see when they come to the Cinque Terre? We have tried to generate a form of tourism that is selective and culturally aware, a tourism that understands what is unique about Cinque Terre, the work of man on the landscape over the millennia. For one thing, visitors here can get a high-angle view on the landscape, 
which is more significant than just a view from the historic centers because it displays the terraces in all their glory. Visitors can only witness the work of recuperation of traditional crops. These cultivated terraces are a monument to Cinque Terre. It's time to start our walk on the very popular coastal connecting path to the next village, made originally by railwaymen when building the tunnels. Right, well, this is where we show our tickets, Dave. The, um, the start of the Via della More. I have to say, this is the uh, first time I've had to pay for a footpath, but it's for a good cause. Very, yes, very yes, faint. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay? Yeah, okay. Oh, you can look back to see where the ferry came in. Some days the sea is too rough for the ferry to operate. Oh Dave, I can see the next village. That's Manarola, just coming up, that's the next village. Beyond that is Cornelia, set high up on the ridge. That's the only one you can't get to via the sea. Then Venazza will be behind that, and the very furthest one in the distance there is Monterosa. I don't think all the walking is going to be as good as this. I think it gets progressively harder. Yes. They start you out easy and then towards the end apparently it gets quite difficult. So we'll give it a go. The National Park runs a bar and cafe right on the path. Bar on the path, sir. I know. How Italian is that? I, went to the next village, I think so. Italian footpaths are often waymarked with a colour code rather than a succession of signposts. Our coastal walk is red and white, but not all the turnings are obvious. Deb, I can't work out where the uh, path goes here. Yeah. Um, presumably through a tunnel. Most things seem to go through a tunnel here. So that's certainly Manarola there. So, or maybe it's down through the station perhaps. Yeah, you're right. It's, uh, down those steps. Always steps. <laughs> yes. You don't realise quite a feat of engineering some of this is. Oh, this is quite different, quite different to Rio Maggiore. Not as quaint, but really very nice. Quite pretty. Again, the same colours on the colour wash on the buildings. Manarola's tiny harbour can't contain the large number of boats owned in the village, so the narrow main street is littered with all types of vessels which are laboriously winched up on trailers. I think it's going to get progressively worse, Dave. The way the, uh, the boats are pulled up on the edge of the bay there, it's uh, 
clear, they can't get much further up. I don't think they do much fishing for commercial use anymore. It's just uh, more recreation and fun. It must be difficult pulling those boats up. I mean, the boat's in the high street. It's very pretty. You can hear and feel the rumble of the trains in the mountain be underneath you. It's quite unnerving at times. The nice view over the town. The school down there. Manarola is originally 12th century, perched on an outcrop and partly extending along a natural canal, the Rio Groppo, which is now covered. There are many important historical buildings concentrated in commanding positions over the village. The terraces are amazing. It's all the Cinquatera vine. I can see the next village. I can't wait to get there. It's, the walk is exciting and it's lovely, lovely villages. The pretty church of San Lorenzo is 14th century and also contains a marble tracery rose window in its Gothic facade. Many years ago, the abundant springs and streams from the mountains of the Cinque Terre were used to turn the blades of many water mills in the area when it was much more populated. This one, Andrian's water mill, is now a small museum in the village. The mill was not only used for grinding imported grain and cereals, but for pressing local olives to make oil. In the past, almost all of the terraces were vineyards. This is a fine example of a wine press. On the start of the coastal walk to the next village, there is a recreation area and lookout spot at Punta Bonfilio, one of six national park serviced areas. The park facilities have been set up to facilitate hiking. This means shelters for hikers run by the park authorities, restaurants where traditional local recipes are served, a botanic trail and a lab to monitor water quality. Thanks to this network of facilities and also to a convenient environmentally sound transport network, which includes electric buses and horse rides in the summer, visitors are able to broaden their knowledge of the area. So we leave Manarola behind. And this is the next stretch of our walk, and there's Cornelia up on the ridge. Oh, there's a landslide been here. Watch where you put in your feet, though. Because it's not quite as paved as the Via della More was. It is the rugged coastline and amazing views that make the coastal walks so popular. Tourists come from all over the world because it's also true that especially from the States they have a very, very big publicity about the Cinque Terre and they all, we always say thank you to a man that is Rick Steve, I don't know if you ever heard about him. He's the man who came for the first time in the Cinque Terre and discovered this land. Now everybody knows the Cinque Terre because they've been declared by UNESCO in 1997 a World Heritage Site. And for example, Americans, Americans, they come from New York if you go to New York, the first thing to see at the airport is a poster of the Cinque Terre, and it's amazing. And so this is because of Rick Steves. But it's also true that now they are coming, and they are coming back because also of the hospitality. Because, I mean, in the Cinque Terre, there are no big hotels, there are no big restaurants, everything is small because the land is narrow. And we are still uh, intact. That's maybe they choose this, I think. I'm intrigued by the number of Americans that are here in the Cinque Terre. How did you hear about it? Uh, Rick Steves, Europe through the back door. Uh, it, he has books and uh, the public TV station 
has his show in my area on every Sunday morning, and I don't do anything when it's on. And he'll do a lot on Europe, and he mentioned this area, and I thought this would be a nice part of our vacation to come here. And it is. It's just absolutely stunning. Uh, where have you come from today? Uh, we started in Monterosa. We took the train down to... Re, was it Ria Monte? Yeah, and so far we've made it down to this point here, and I guess Cornelia is right over there, which is where we're headed. And I think we're planning on having lunch in uh, Veranosa. So it's wonderful. Are you staying only in the Cinque Terre? No, we were in Venice before that, and Florence before that, and Rome before that. <laughs> so we've been doing like if it's Tuesday, this must be something. <laughs> but uh, I can't believe this. I just cannot believe this, how beautiful it is. I'm going to show our tickets here. Okay, arrivederci. Buona passeggiata. Grazie. That's a nice job there, doesn't it? I'll say. Just hang around and do this spot with me. Like this, yeah. Amongst the Mediterranean plants on the trail are prickly pears, which are served at many of the local restaurants. This looks like a, one of the old vineyards. I don't think it's abandoned because the dry stone walling's in pretty good shape and there's still those irrigation black tubing. There must be a lot of work to maintain that. This is the old railway line and we're heading in towards Cornelia. That's where the steps start. I think there's something like over 30 flights of steps. For those that didn't want to climb 300 feet up to Cornelia, the park runs one of its green buses, waiting near the station. Here we go on the steps. A true hill town, Cornelia is the only one of the five coastal villages that is inaccessible from the sea, being built on a rocky promontory. Hanging in there. I think this is the top. Sure looks like it. There are allegedly over 400 of these, but at least it's not like a staircase. It's... It is, it's the top. Imagine doing that every day from work. Although our walk was cooled by the sea breeze, it was actually a very hot day, and we were ready yeah. for refreshment. Perfect. That's even better. The Church of San Pietro dates from 1334 and has a facade that contains, yet again, a beautiful white marble tracery rose window, probably the finest and certainly the oldest of the five villages. A familiar sight in Italy are the little motorised trucks, fondly known as ape cars, that can negotiate the narrow streets and alleys. Dating from Roman times, Cornelia is the village least touched by modernity. Yes. 
We had a long afternoon ahead of us and it was time to stock up. Supposed to be 300 feet down there, Deb. Mm -hmm. From Cornelia's vantage point, I could see the whole of the Cinque Terre's dramatic coastline, and in the distance, Vernazza, our next village with its distinctive watchtower. Towards the mountains, the town opens onto a natural and intensively cultivated basin. Its origins, like most of the villages, lie in farming. So the sea is big in front of us. So why we don't fish, but we have terraces and vineyards? Yes. Well, there is an explanation for everything because we start to have to know the Cinque Terre before the 11th century, and the people who start to come and live in the Cinque Terre, they used to come from inland. So the only thing they knew was agriculture. So that's why they built all these terraces hauled by dry stone walls. So that's why they never fish at the beginning, because anywhere they were scared by the attacks coming from the sea, pirates, mm. corsairs, Saracens. So that's why they did all these terraces. Our next coastal path was going to be much steeper and rockier than we had experienced so far and rock falls onto the ancient terraces are common. Buonasera, is the path open? Yeah, now it's open. No? <laughs> <laughs> and it's okay to go? Yeah, yeah. It's okay. All the way to Veneta? Yeah. Thank you. Well, that's good. Uh, we overheard that um, the path was shut, but it's not anymore, so that's good. Sounds like it was, though, so luckily they've cleared whatever landslide it was, and we can go. These are olive nets by the look of them. The nets are ready to be unrolled when the olives begin to fall from the trees. A little bit rough underfoot, but it's okay. Just got to watch where you place your feet. Our steep climb out of Cornelia rewarded us with an amazing panorama. I could see the old railway tunnel, now replaced by a much deeper line inside the mountain. San Bernardino, perched high on the cliff top, experienced a huge landslide in the 19th century, ruining much of the terracing below it. This is just so lovely, the peacefulness of it. You can just imagine this people for hundreds of years, thousands of years out here, toiling away making the terraces. You can see where the, the landslide can come down. So it's man against nature. There's a path up there, by the side of the ravine. It's just somebody going through there now. So we've got a little way to go yet. <laughs> oh, I've got a friend. I've got a friend. <laughs> I have got some disgracefully yummy cake. Breathtaking. 
I think we're getting close now. That house is lived in with various people, so I think we might be on the outskirts. And there's the sign for Velazza. We're almost there. Oh. A rocky climb in this park. Yeah, I'll say. What a fantastic view. Every step of the way. We've been walking along the top of these dry stone walls the whole time. Can you see Venazzi yet? No. <laughs> They've been cheating us, I think. I think that was a false alarm, that sign. I think it was too. There's no sign of it yet. We descended through olive groves and finally were rewarded with the view of the castle, still another mile to go. Ah, maybe this is why the path was closed earlier. Somebody's been out and shifted a bit, but you can see where all the earth gets into the, the stone wall and helps to keep it together. Lots of roots and mud. Got a smell as well. Yes, yeah, smell of earth. It smells of old cellars. <laughs> yes. And there it is. That's the watchtower. Oh, look at that. This really is something to see. Venazza is perhaps the most dramatic and beautiful of the Cinque Terre villages. Tall, pastel-coloured, tower-shaped houses extend along the river valley and rise up to the summit of this rocky outcrop. Looking up from the harbour, we could see a strange-looking contraption. The monorails help our modern farmers in the park go about their daily work on the steep terraces, lightening the load of the heavy baskets which were used years ago. We have a landscape university programme whereby students can come and stay in the Cinque Terre and help maintain the walls, terraces and vineyards. The park's aim is to make Cinque Terre a centre for the improvement of the quality of life. So we are developing organic farming and the park will soon boast around 30 products that are organically and locally produced. We have established initiatives to stimulate environmentally aware tourism by offering practices such as naturopathy and plant reflexology. We need a long-term project, one that will stretch beyond our lifetime into the next 200 years. Such a project will make sure that the environment benefits from the sustainable tourism, a tourism which will not only refrain from damaging the environment, but actually nurture it. The main street of Venazza is full of local produce, both in the shops and restaurants. Just two white wines are produced in the region, Cinque Terra DOC and Chacatra. A cooperative operates here, and all of its food and wine has a mark of authenticity on the label.
castle. Might be a bit of a climb, Dave. Well, we're used to that by now. <laughs> These are fantastic, the way these houses are built, one upon the other almost. Mm, smell of washing powder. I think every day is washed then. <laughs> Mercury. It smells a bit musty as well, a bit slightly damp. Builders are doing the guttering as it looks like rain. Oh, there's some fantastic views from up here. The Castello Belforte watches over the harbour and the town, and its ruined tower and pre 11th century fortifications are a reminder of the port's importance to the 13th century Genoan Republic. Behind me, out on the edge of the rock, is Cornelia, where we've just come from, and the path under the hillside there. It's a lot of steps, and it looks a lot steeper than when we were actually doing it. Apparently the worst is yet to come from Venazza to Monterosso. Our last visit, before leaving charming Venazza, was to the church of San Margarita di Antiochia, built in Ligurian Gothic style, it has three naves and has undergone many alterations over the years. Just got to find the path to Monterosso. That's Cornelia. I have a feeling it's not far from here. <laughs> there it is. It's getting narrower. It's definitely the way because there's a signpost back there on the wall. These little electric carts, little caterpillar treads. Some building that came up. Yes. Just. Everywhere you look, there's some marvellous views. Thank you. Oh, it's going to get worse. <laughs> Going up through the vineyards. Imagine going back down that monorail on that little cart. There's a path over there. It's quite a trail of people over there. At last, a view of the final village, Monterosso. We're on the top of a stone wall again. How far up do you think we are? About 500 feet. Yeah, I can believe it when you look down at that drop. But you get the views from here, don't you? Even if you're out of breath. <laughs> How are you doing, babe? All right, just watching where I put my feet, but other than that, it's fine. Very busy path this afternoon. Oh, I don't think it, it ever isn't. Where are we going down?
lovely natural stone bridge. Luckily it's got mortar to hold it together. That's gorgeous. It is, it's very pretty. You've got to make sure you look where you're going. There are no road safety rules on footpaths, but this part of the coastal walk was like a single track road with no passing places. Far to the end of our journey now. It's definitely going downhill. Just about at the end of. Yes. It's the end of our journey, as well as the Cinque Terre path, Monterosa, the last of the villages. Oh, what a wonderful sight. That looks good enough to get in. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I could do with the rest now. You do with the drink? Yes. <laughs> of anything? It's been a great walk though, it really has. Monte Rosso is different to the other villages. It has beaches. They are divided by a small headland which serves to separate the old village from the new town of Fegina. Because boats can land easily here, the town has a long history of fishing. Restaurants like the Belvedere on the seafront serve the local fish and wine. How long has the restaurant been here? We are the owners since 1991, but uh, it has been here since the 60s. It was, there was another family we took over in uh, 1991. And uh, is your family from Liguria? Yes, my father is from Vernazza and my mom from Monteros. A local family, Very yes. Luxury, yes. <laughs> yeah. Five members of the Moschia family run the restaurant and own a nearby hotel. Federico's mother Santina is the chef, helped by his father. The family emigrated to South Africa some years ago, but have returned to their roots in the Cinque Terre to build up a successful business. Santina, what are the local dishes that are popular with tourists? The main dish with pasta is pesto. And um, I don't know why, but um, they like ours the most. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then um, the anchovy dishes, oh, very, nice. very much. Of course, they are our own anchovies, mm -hmm. fish around here. Mm. Mainly all the restaurants here in the Cinque Terre, when it's the season, June, May, June, July, we sold them. And then we use them after three months mainly. Mm -hmm. And then you serve them with garlic, oregano, and our own olive oil. Mm -hmm. So you can have them unsalted as well as salted? Yes, fresh, mm. fresh, and stuffed. I would like you to try them later, which they're very nice. Okay. It's a poor food, mm -hmm. the, the, our own food. It's poor, it's not very rich, but there's plenty of work with it. Mm. You use bread. Mm -hmm. uh, the bread of the day after, mm -hmm. not the fresh bread. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, poor, there's uh, herbs, mm -hmm. plenty of herbs, oregano, which grows here. There's um, uh, majorana. I don't know what you call it in English. Which Is it majorana? Uh, yes. We use plenty of that. Mm -hmm. And garlic. And uh, not much else. You see, mm -hmm. that's why, but it's very nice. Federico, the, the fishing tradition seems to be more in Monterosso than the other villages. Yes, Monterosso has uh, maintained his 
more or less is uh, fishing traditions to nowadays also. And uh, the fishermen, especially girls, in the summer uh, period from May, June, July and August, they go out with the lamparas. They leave in the, at 11 o'clock, more 12 o'clock in the, in the night. They come back at 5 o'clock uh, in the morning. They stay out with these big lamps they have, where the fish all come under the lamps, especially anchovies. That's our main fishing tradition. So all the recipes come from the anchovies. And then the other types of fish, sword fishes, when the season is for uh, sword fishing, and tuna fishes too. But the main tradition, we can say, is anchovies. We also have local mussels. They come from um, near Spezia, mm -hmm. Porto Venere. Have you been there? Yes. It's a lovely place. Beautiful, yes. um, Maybe you've seen that they grow mussels. Our own mussels are very nice, small, mm -hmm. very full, mm -hmm. and uh, we stuff them. Another lovely dish is, um, you know, the one with all plenty of... Um, Not the octopus. Octopus, right. Ah. I could, uh, why did I forget that? <laughs> okay. uh, we cook plenty of uh, octopus. Mm. We boil it and we, we make salad with it. Now it's season of a big fish. You know, in the middle of August until the end of September, it's round and black. We fillet them and we are served with, uh, with potatoes and mushrooms, which now it's starting the season with, of mushrooms, ah. so I serve that. My daughter-in-law just filleted. It's a <laughs> lovely fish. And we call it um, rondine, and rondine it's like a swallow because it's black. Federico, can you tell us about the local wine? Yes, we have. Uh, Cinque Terre region is especially known for its white wines. Mm. And uh, Chacetra, that's made with uh, the best grapes. They lay in the sun from the harvest that takes place in mid-September uh, mm -hmm. till the end of November. Then we make wine of it, yes. and that uh, comes out a sugary, tasty wine. Mm -hmm. Then we have our white wines. They are made with uh, three types of grapes. They have to be three grapes to become a DOC. Chin yes. In different percentage, they become a Cinque Terre DOC. This is a Cinque Terre DOC. It gets the best uh, grapes of the Rio Maggiore, Manarola, Corniglia, Bernazza and Monterosso. And it makes this uh, DOC cooperative. I see. Oh, wow. Yes. Let's see this some more. Yeah. Now, I'm not a professional wine taster, so I'm oh. just going to drink it. Okay. <laughs> mm. Oh, that's nice. Oh, these are dry mm. wines because the soil isn't so rich as in other regions, and mm -hmm. this, we have a lot of sun, and that makes it. Uh, the difference. Yes, that's a dry one, yes. That was really, really nice. Yeah, right. now, this is the... <laughs> this the, is the, the special famous, one. yes, the oh. famous Chacetra. That's lovely colour. Yes. That's, uh, yes. Oh, is it very different? Yes, very this different is different. Yes. Mm. It has a sweet, oh. sweet taste. Oh, yes. yes. Completely is, different. Yes. This has more alcoholic degrees, at least uh, 14 and a half. You can see it on the, on the on glass. On the glass, yes. yes. And it's very good for end meals and desserts. Well, it seems to, yeah. to lay on the tongue more. Yes, yes. It's persistent, more yes. persistent yes. in the mouth. 90% of the wine they make here is sold here. You don't really find it anywhere else. We had an hour or so before the last ferry was to leave Monterosso and wandered the streets and piazzas. They were much wider than the other villages. The 13th century church of San Giovanni Battista has a striking two-tone marble facade and contains, of course, a white marble tracery rose window.
The castle ruins built on the hill of St. Christopher played an important defensive role in the 7th century, right through to more recent conflicts. The National Park's Virtual Aquarium is located here. Around this part of the coast is a protected marine reserve. Visitors can view the rich variety of aquatic life present in the Ligurian Sea. An hour had slipped by, and before we knew, it was time to leave the Cinque Terre with one last look at the villages. destination was Venice. Footloose in Venice does inevitably involve water, but it is possible to explore the city and find its delightful corners on foot. Everyone has heard of Venice, and most people have seen enough pictures for it to seem almost familiar. Around 15 million tourists a year come to this famous city, built on mudflat islets in a lagoon, founded 1500 years ago. In its heyday as a republic, Venice housed 200,000 people. Today there are fewer than 70,000 who live here. We thought we'd begin exploring Venice with an early morning start at the Rialto Market where fish and produce have been sold in the same place, in the same tradition for hundreds of years. In a city built on water, everything is delivered by boat and fruit, vegetables and fish are brought to market here at the Rialto, the traditional setting for one of Italy's most vibrant markets. <laughs> The colours here are simply astounding. Oh, smell the herbs. So fresh. It's just been picked. Look at it. it sparkles with water. It's so fresh. Strawberries, blackberries, and loganberries, and raspberries, figs. Oh, it just goes on and on. Prickly pears. I wonder if they came from the Cinque Terre. The vegetables were equally colourful and varied, brought here at dawn to be on sale early for the restaurants, shops and Venetians to buy before starting work. The fish market is held in Campo della Pescari, in the market hall especially built for that purpose. Because of its design, with lofty ceiling and open archways, the Pescaria market has only a faint aroma of fish and smells remarkably fresh. I have never seen so much fish. All the varieties, octopus, squid, clams, oysters, mussels, and all the other fish I can't name. The Pescaria and most of the larger wholesalers close down for the day at 1pm and most of the surrounding old-fashioned bars keep hours to match the working day of the Rialto porters. Venetians are making their way to work 
and traditionally stand when crossing the Canal Grande in the gondola-shaped Traghetti. The Rialto Bridge, so crowded during the day, at this hour is simply a bridge for early morning workers. This is the church of San Giacomo di Rialto, the oldest church in Venice said to be founded in the 5th century. It has a 15th century 24-hour clock above the entrance and it faces the market square, once used by Venetian bankers and moneylenders and presumably Shakespeare's Shylock had he lived. On the outside of the apse, there is a 12th century inscription to the merchants of the Rialto. Around this temple, let the merchant's law be just, his weights true, and his promises faithful. The church is said to be founded on the same day as Venice itself, the 25th of March in 421, and the clock is famous for its inaccuracy. It has been incorrect since its installation in the 15th century. The market arcades are becoming empty now and the first tourists begin to appear. The shops and stalls are slowly opening, hoping to catch early shoppers. Everything is on show, designed to attract the visitor. Venice earned its reputation as the bazaar of Europe from the markets of the Rialto. Virtually anything could be bought or sold here. It was the commercial heart of the Republic. Leaving the markets behind, only a few footsteps away is the Rialto Bridge and Canal Grande. The restaurants are empty, tables laid in preparation for the busy day ahead. The Rialto Bridge was finished in 1592. This exquisite design was the winner in a competition that included Michelangelo. It replaced a bridge of boats. How many millions of hands over the centuries have smoothed this marble? Still early, but the visitors are now three deep and the view over the canal is fascinating. The Canal Grande is the major waterway that snakes through the heart of the city. Every inch is packed with glorious buildings, from water-lapped palaces to magnificent churches. The Ponte di Rialto, the Academia Bridge built in 1932, the distinctive outline of the 17th century church of Santa Maria della Salute. The San Marco Campanile towers majestically in the sun over San Marco Square. Ferrovia where the train meets the boat. A good place to catch the famous Vaporetti, the crowded water buses that chug up and down the larger canals. There are plenty of routes to choose from and they are cheap to use, but always crowded during the day. The water taxis are much sleeker, but also more expensive. But when image counts, they certainly fit the bill. The Grand Canal is a working waterway. With no roads, absolutely everything has to be transported on water. The romantic gondolas are unique to Venice and have plied the famous waterways for centuries. The red one is a competition boat, training for the carnival held in February. Even in Venice, traffic jams can occur. The original 11th century gondolas were 12 oared with an iron beak, but shrank in size over the next two centuries, 
gaining gaily coloured coverings and the little chair they still carry today. By the 16th century, gondolas had become grand symbols of social ostentation, but an edict in 1562 changed the gondola's appearance for good. They became uniformly black. Shelley wrote of them as moths of which a coffin might have been the chrysalis. No one can resist the lure of the gondola and the gondolieri. Can they all be that gorgeous? Of course, we could not pass up the opportunity to have our own gondola ride. Our gondolier was Lino. We're off. <laughs> yes, I'm trying to relax. You look on your right side. Yes. This is the name Palazzo Labia. Now inside is the television, is the eye. Is the television. So the Italy. This is the Grand Canal. If you long, is the five kilometers. Five. Fantastic. <laughs> Waited a long time for this trip. Yes, I'm settling now. <laughs> Just that first moment of getting here, I think. No, there is normal. Can you go is the gondola? You go in the canal or small canal on your left. I see. There is another boat. Can you go on your right? I see. There is is the similar is the England. Yes. <laughs> the gondola is made from seven different woods. The distinctive oarlock, usually made from walnut or cherry, is known as a forcola and allows the long oar to be used in eight different positions. <laughs> On your left, there is a church. If you church is the San Marcuola. In Venice, is the many church in Venice. It's the 120. We were going to temporarily turn off the Canal Grande and discover the enchanting network of small canals that thread their way throughout the island. This is the normal, is the small canal, can you go possible? Is the gondola or another boat? There is no motorboat. Yeah. In the another mouth, there is, is the October. There is, is the possible one, two, three days. So the problem is the flow of the water. There is, is no possible trip to the gondola. So in the small canals. Oh. There is, is the problem how many bridges in Venice? <laughs> Now in Venice is the about in the total Venice is the 400 bridge. Yes. With its long slender shape and all these blind corners, you wonder how they manage to avoid collisions. The gondolieri have a distinctive call to warn of their approach. Aye. No. This piego. No, no can. No, que es el problema, no que es el problema. No, no está de problema. No que es el problema, dice que es el cualquier pico que exposta a especies. Porque mira, le llamo, yo le digo, 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 yo
These possible accidents. Yeah. <laughs> We're well safe. So. Welcome. <laughs> In the front, you look, is another church. It's the church, is the Misericordia. You look, it's the lime green, all together building. Yeah. This is the maximum tip of the water in Venice. The green algae on the walls of the crumbling buildings shows the extent of the daily tide, which normally rises and falls 20 to 30 centimeters every six hours. There are seasonal high and low tides, which can cause problems. Every bend now presented danger. Nothing. <laughs> so the red ones are for the regatta. Is there another color? Is the normal? Is the competition Venice? So the regatta storica, regatta di Burano. Yeah. We had turned a corner so many times, we hadn't a clue where we were. At last, a landmark we recognized, the Strada Nova, the main street in Venice. We were nearly back at the Canal yeah. Grande. On your right of the building, there is your look, is the fish market. Back out onto the Grand Canal? Yes. You look to the left side, this building is the 1,000 years ago. There is, is the first building in Venice, it's the Damosto Palace. Inside there is open the big museum. In the front, you look at so the long bridge in Venice. It's the Rialto Bridge. This is the best way to see it on the gondola. So busy. In this position, this is the Rialto. There is no many motorboat or many movies of the boat. So the tip of the water, this in the Grand Canal is the six meter in the middle, this, and near building is the four meter. It's the maximum tip of the water in Venice. Can you go from San Marco Square? It's a very large. There is about 10, 15 meters. How are your arms, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Long trip. Enjoy. Oh, very much. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you. Wherever you go, there is constant restoration work. Venice has been in very real danger of sinking by the withdrawal of millions of gallons of water directly from the ground by the industries in nearby Marghera. Thankfully, construction of two aqueducts and the sealing of Marghera's artesian wells in 1975 appears to have resulted in the rise of two centimetres of the land level of some parts of the historic centre. Venice floods several times a year, and when that happens, they have raised walkways placed at several sites around the city.
Beginning in low-lying areas like Piazza San Marco, the flood water rapidly spreads throughout the city. Shopkeepers insert steel shutters into their doorways to keep the water out, and teams of council workers lay walkways of the duckboards to dry land. It was time to explore the rest of Venice on foot. This is the Strada Nova, the city's main street. This way to St Mark's Square, this is the very heart of Venice. I could hear the music from the cafe orchestras echoing through the columns. Isn't it beautiful? The Piazza San Marco was the political and spiritual heart of Venice, for the city's founders built their citadel, the Palazzo Ducale, and their most important church, the mosaic-encrusted Basilica di San Marco, here. Over the centuries, the Basilica became the most exotic and richest church in Christendom, and the Palazzo Ducale housed the most enduring system of republican government. The public space surrounding these two magnificent buildings was thought to be so dignified that no other square in the city was fit to be called Piazza. The Basilica was first built in 828. This version, modelled on Constantine's mausoleum, was started in 1063, and the Greek and Byzantine influences are quite evident. The Campanile was originally a combined lighthouse and bell tower in the 10th century. At 99 metres, the Campanile is the tallest structure in the city. In 1902, the tower collapsed, with miraculously only one casualty, the caretaker's cat. The basilica and six shirts that the caretaker's wife had ironed earlier survived. The tower was rebuilt, where it was and as it was, and at an inauguration banquet in 1912, six honoured guests wore the six shirts that had been rescued nearly ten years earlier. Each of the five bells in the tower had a distinct function, like starting or finishing the working day, or signalling members to hurry to the council chamber in the Palazzo Ducale. The view from the top of the tower is well worth the wait in the queue below. The Republic of Venice rose to become Europe's main trading post between the West and East and at its height controlled an empire that spread north to the Dolomites and over the sea as far as Cyprus. The Molo was the traditional front door to Venice since all important visitors arrived by sea. The two columns topped by a statue of St Theodore, the Byzantine patron saint of Venice, and a winged lion. There should have been a third column, but it fell off the barge they were being transported on in 1170 and has remained submerged ever since. In the distance is the causeway, which links Venice by road and rail to the mainland town of Mestre. The distant industrial skyline contains all the ingredients of a modern city that Venice clearly does not. The Palazzo Ducale was the Venetian Republic's seat of government and the residence of the Doge. All facets of Venetian life took their pulse beat from the architecturally stunning building. Legend has it that the two reddish columns on the upper arcade were stained by the blood of traitors whose tortured bodies were commonly hung here. On the right, the Prigioni Nuove, New Prisons, were joined to the Palazzo Ducale by the Ponte dei Sospiri, the Bridge of Sighs. Built in 1600, the bridge takes its popular name from the supposed sighs of the prisoners who shuffled through its corridor. Prior to the new prisons being built, prisoners were kept in either the swelteringly hot leads under the roof of the Palazzo Ducale or the dank wells in the bottom two storeys. Casanova was imprisoned here, and in 1756 he made a daring escape. He made a hole in the ceiling in his cell and escaped over the rooftops, forced his way into the ducal palace, 
and then was released in error as a visitor. Just a short walk along the waterfront, away from the piazza, and we leave the crowds of tourists behind. The Arsenale was the staging area for Venice's sea mite. 16,000 workers toiled here to build ships at the height of the Republic's power. A warship could be fitted out in a single day. For us, the real delight of Venice was walking the back streets. The jewel casket church of Santa Maria dei Miracoli was built in 1481-1489 to house an image of a Madonna painted by Niccolò di Pietro in 1409 that began working miracles 70 years later. Local legend asserts that the materials for the multicoloured marble cladding and inlays were surplus from the decoration of St Mark's Basilica. It looks like you could even shake hands up there, it's so narrow. Monumental mason, I think. Yeah. Okay. Not a lot of room for those down in the street there. Or on the Vaporetti. Yeah. This is one of the many tiny workshops tucked away in decrepit buildings. The impressive facade of the Santa Maria Assunta Church is better known as the Jesuiti, and its interior has some breathtaking green and white marble carving, which, though beautiful, is very heavy and is a factor in subsidence problems with the church. This is the ghetto. It was named after a 14th century cannon casting foundry. The Venetian word for foundry is ghetto. It is a name given to Jewish enclaves the world over, but this is the original. The ghetto buildings were not allowed to be more than one third higher than the rest of Venice. Stories were made as low as possible to fit more in. Seven was usual. At one time, the ghetto hosted a peak of 5,000 Jews. There are memorial bronzes to the Holocaust on one side of the square. Off the northern shore of the city is San Michele Island, the cemetery of Venice, established by Napoleonic decree. And Catholic decedents lie here for only 10 years when their bones are dug up and removed to an ossuary. Protestant dead, never numerous, remain where they are. And there is a separate Jewish cemetery on the Lido. We're heading for the island of glass, Murano where hopefully we're going to see some glass made and a demonstration in the factories. The island of Murano was once a self-governed enclave within the Republic and was a popular summer retreat for Venice's elite. It has a miniature Canal Grande and its fondamente are lined with shops selling glassware, its only industry. 
Venetian glass furnaces were moved to Murano in 1291 for risk of fire in central Venice. The skill of Muranese glass blowers is legend and closely guarded. Up until the 17th century, any glassmaker who left Murano was branded a traitor. Glass blowers enjoyed unprecedented privileges and on occasion even normal principles of justice were sometimes waived, even in cases of murder. In this furnace, a glassmaker is applying the famous Milaflori to what will become a glass bowl. The assistant prepares the gold leaf for the glassmaker to roll onto the molten glass. galleries. We're on our way to find a master sculptor and mask maker, Guerino Levato. Paintings of Dorsodura's art galleries and religious institutions draw most visitors across the Ponte della Academia. The waterfront square attracts local artists. Academia is part of the Dorsoduro district, or Sestiere, one of six large administrative areas of Venice. The Sestiere's name translates as hard back and its buildings occupy the largest area of firm silt in the centre of the city. The Dorso Duro is quieter than other parts of Venice and it is a pleasant area to stroll the pretty streets and browse in the varied shops. This antiques barge is moored on the edge of Campo San Barnaba. Nearby is one of the bridges which were literally battlegrounds for organised brawls between two rival factions of the city. Tucked away in a pretty back street is the amazing workshop of the sculptor and mask maker Guerino Lovato. It is clear as you walk over the threshold that these are the true handmade masks that Venice is famous for and not the mass-produced ones the gift shops sell. The workshop is known as Mondo Novo Mascara, New World Masks. Signor Lovato is equally famous for his sculptures and his latest work, taken from a 1947 painting, is exhibited at a Dali Centennial exhibition. His mask-making skill is internationally known in the film and theatre, and his designs have been used in films such as Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut and Kenneth Branagh's Much Ado About Nothing. I've been working as a mask maker in Venice for 25 years. 
We started at the end of the 1970s following a resurgence of interest in the popular culture of the carnival. The new Venice carnival started in 1980. Before then, the carnival had been a way of remembering the old carnival of the Renaissance, which had made Venice famous. But after the fall of the Republic, the carnival was not celebrated again with the same importance. It was only in the 1980s that the Biennale Teatro reinvented the carnival, which is now one of the greatest tourist attractions of the city. The rebirth of the carnival brought a resurgence in related activities such as mask making, costume making, food entertainment, music and theatre. We started making masks just before this idea of a new carnival began to take hold. Masks had always been used in the theatre by actors and they were made with the same technique that we use today. You start with a clay model from which plaster mould is made and this is lined with paper mache which is then cut, finished and decorated to create a mask in the style of traditional Italian theatre. Here in Mondo Novo we have around 1,000 examples of masks. It's a kind of anthology of European history. Portrait masks, Egyptian masks, Greek ones, Renaissance, medieval, baroque, contemporary, masks from the world of comedy and fashion, which we create for different occasions, such as theatre and cinema. We continue to produce these in the traditional way and sell them in the Mondo Novo workshop. The best known Venetian masks date from the 1700s. The most popular by far is the Bauta, which was white and worn by both men and women. In the 1700s, men didn't have beards, so it was not possible to tell the gender of the person wearing the mask. This beak permitted eating, drinking and even smoking. Smoking was always popular. This is the most famous mask in the history of Venice because it was such a rarity in Europe that people would be allowed to walk around the city wearing masks. In Venice, this was a year-round fashion. Masks could be worn at all times. The bauta was worn by everyone the poor and the rich, men and women. But for women only, still in the 1700s, there was still this mask called Moretta. Moro in Venetian means black. It had no fasteners and was held by the mouth, which beat into a button on the inside of the mouth, like this. For this reason, it was also called muta, mute. When people wanted to converse, they had to hold the mask in their hands. The mask was black to create a contrast with the pale skin of the woman who wore it. Women shunned the sun in those days. I Veneziani avevano in questo dettato una moda the Venetians invented a fashion which in France, Germany and perhaps even in England meant that masks were used as a part of everyday dress. This was known as Venetian costume. It was a style which lasted in Venice for about 50 years and featured those two masks, which could be called civilian masks as opposed to theatrical ones because they were not worn by actors on stage but normal people wore them to go out in the street. One mask that has been particularly popular in recent years, thanks to its unusual iconography and also because it has been used widely in cinema, it featured, for example, in Zeffirelli Straviata 20 years ago, is the mask of the plague doctor. It was originally used as a medical tool, not a stage mask. The large beak was filled with a filter of perfumed herbs which allowed the wearer to breathe without catching the disease. 
doctors used to enter the houses of the disease to remove the pus which had formed on the body of the patients using long scissors that measured two meters. The first documented appearance of this mass dates back from the first half of the 16th century, the time of one of the most significant outbreaks of plague in Venice. We have only talked about three masks, but the art of comedy has much more complex history, with the words of characters such as Pantalone, Harlequin, Punch and Brigella. There are also mythological masks, such as that of Aelos, and the carnival masks, such as that of the Jester King. These are all kinds of characters, each of which has a long and interesting story. It is evening now, and as we head back towards the centre of the city, the shop windows begin to glow, enticing you inside. It's a rare quiet time for residents. The tourists have gone back to their hotels and it's a time for families to leave their gardenless apartments and enjoy the early evening warmth and atmosphere of the Campo. Grandparents watch over the children and chat to friends before the evening meal. Most tend to eat early and nightlife is gentle here. It's not possible to see all that Venice has to offer in a single visit. It begs you to come back. 